Now that we've talked about kind of what goes into the lighting, let's talk about different types of lighting that we're going to be using in the realm of television studio production and lighting and electronic news gathering. And lighting can come in a variety of sources from a variety of locations. The first one is the sun. And one of the downsides of the sun is that its light is constantly changing. It gets it's dim in the morning, it's bright in midday, it gets dim in the evening, and so it's never the same. Plus, you also have things like atmosphere, cloud, rain that can come into play and make light from the sun a little difficult to work with. And especially there's a, there's a time of perfect lighting that a lot of photographers use called the golden hour. And this is sort of an hour right around sunrise and sunset. And so you're limited to just however long the light will last for about maybe an hour or so to pull that out. So because of this, you don't have a static quality source of light that you can constantly use. So one type of light that does provide you a static type of light that doesn't change is called an incandescent light bulb. And these are the traditional light bulbs that a lot of people were hanging up in, you know, ceilings, buildings, offices, things like that. And so with incandescent light bulbs, they're not as bright as the sunlight. And pretty dramatically, they're not as bright as sunlight. But their temperature color does come in at 32K. And this is a type of uh, color temperature that TV studios and a lot of offices will come into play. Now, this does have a little bit more yellow in it than sunlight. Sunlight's kind of a little more orangish, but not by much. So the cool thing about incandescent lights is that the color can be changed or corrected by the use of filters. So we can take a different color uh, filament and wrap it around the light to change its color. So we can get like a red light bulb or a blue light bulb or a green light bulb, um, things like that. So when you do that, this type of color change has to be done on the light bulb itself to adjust things like that. Now, other type of uh, incandescent light bulbs do exist. You also have things like tungsten halogen lamps, also known as quartz lamps. And with an incandescent light bulb, it's basically a little wire filament that's passing a current. And inside the glass bulb is going to be a type of gas of some kind that basically kind of helps control and regulate the heat and electricity to give you the specific glow. And the light bulbs come in a variety of different shapes. So this is a little tube light that's only about like that big that can fit into a lighting instrument along with these other lighting bulbs, which again, you know, relatively small light bulbs. And they have unique bottoms that could either plug in and lock or you would have this one that would sort of like twist and lock as opposed to the traditionals that would just sort of like screw in and screw out. Now, one downside to these is that these light bulbs can get extremely hot. And so they generate not only light, but these older ones were generating a lot of heat. So you had to be careful, especially if you just turn the bulb off. You could possibly turn, um, you know, burn your hand. So here's a question for you. How hot can an incandescent light bulb get? Think about that in Fahrenheit. How hot do you think it would get? Incandescent light bulbs actually generate more heat than light. Switch to energy efficient CFLs and LEDs, and you'll realize just how much cash you were really burning through. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. So, light bulbs can actually get hot, get pretty hot to cook off of. Um, but do you think people have actually like done it? Eh, it's possible. Glass light bulbs can get anywhere between 392 degrees Fahrenheit or 200 degrees Celsius and up to 500 degrees Fahrenheit. So, yeah, you can actually cook food on a light bulb. It's not very efficient because you're using a lot of electricity to pull that off. Now, have people tried to cook with light bulbs before? Absolutely. And even uh, you may know someone who's, tried, who's actually cooked with a light bulb as well. If you've ever known anybody to have an easy bake oven or had uh, a cake or some cookies from someone who cooked with one of these, then yeah. And if you're not familiar with these, what this is, is it's a small little box and inside is a hundred watt light bulb. And you could create small baked goods, put them in a pan and you would slide them in 
and you would let them cook for two to three hours and you would get, you know, a little dessert and then you would slide it out the other side and you would have a nice little dessert. Now, because of the low wattage, it would take these things a lot longer to cook than you would get in a traditional oven. But it is possible to cook with a light bulb. Now, another type of light bulb, because we just talked about incandescence. So now this is a new type of light bulb that came out um, much later called a fluorescent light bulb. And with the fluorescent light bulbs, their color temperatures are at about 5,000 degrees Kelvin. They the, they can get into the 56K. Uh, they're not really good at uh, the 32K. They guarantee give you more of the bright day lights that's starting out. Now, the nice thing about these is that the physical heat temperature of these is a lot colder than incandescents. So if you turned off a fluorescent, then the temperature, then when you grab the bulb, it would not burn you because they didn't get as hot as other as the in, traditional incandescent light bulb. <clears throat> now, the way they were built after they came out with the first generation, which could only stick out in like 56K, they were able to adjust the color temperature of the other light bulbs. So now you could actually buy a light bulb in the, the 27 to 3000. You could buy one in the three to 41. And this is when you would see names on the side of the light bulb boxes, like a warm light, a soft light is gonna be kind of yellowish. The cool white or the bright white are gonna start being a combination between those versus the natural daylight and the daylight. So the 56K and the, and the 65K. So, once they got a little more advanced, they were able to learn how to better manufacture the bulbs. They could then create bulbs that would fit different lighting schemes better. Now, with fluorescent light bulbs, the advantage was, again, the operating temperature for these was a lot less. And the cost for, to run the electricity on these is a lot cheaper. So you're saving more money than you would with an incandescent light bulb. And they also used a lesser, uh, lesser, less electricity. Now, a downside to these is they cost more in the initial setup and the initial purchase. So, to buy an instrument like this, you might be spending anywhere from about eleven or two thousand dollars to get a panel that would have little um, fluorescent bulbs inside of it. And the fluorescent bulbs cost more than incandescent, so you're paying a little more, a little bit more money up front. Now. One of the other downsides is they're only good at throwing light everywhere. You couldn't take a fluorescent and just kind of channel the light so it would only hit one particular area. That's just they weren't designed or set up that way. So they were usually put in large arrays and they could just throw light everywhere in a broad area. So one of the other disadvantages of them is the gas inside of the tubes contains mercury. Uh, an element on the periodic table, and it's also very dangerous to humans. So breathing it and touching it is never a good thing. And one of the things they would always say is if you drop or broke a fluorescent tube or a fluorescent bulb, you need to back away and let it settle because you'd have mercury vapor in the air. Likewise, if you're sweeping the glass up, then that could also cause a problem because you're stirring that mercury vapor back up. And if you get too much in your system over time, it could lead to some health issues. Now, the next type of light I want to talk about is what's called an LED, or a light-emitting diode. And that's just this little piece of filament that's encased in plastic. And LEDs can come in a wide, vari a wide variety of sizes, shapes, colors, um, applications. And if you've ever been to a sporting event and you've seen like a, a large video board, then you're looking at a display that has millions and millions of LEDs. Likewise, with computer monitors, your phone, um, smartwatches, little LEDs are in there providing light that can be used. But LEDs are only um, relatively recent in use. Now, they have been around for quite a while. And so... They've been used for a lot of different functions. So back in, you know, the, the I guess the 40s or the 50s and such, they were using them for computer displays. So you could use them to see if something was working. They had them for basic digital displays. Even in the 60s and 70s, they could be used for video games. And the two the three main colors you would have for them were going to be red, green, and yellow, or amber. And so 
this was basically how LEDs have been around since like the 50s and 60s. And nothing really changed until the late 90s, early 2000s. And that came about, I'm sorry, 1994. Uh, yeah, uh, mid to late 90s. Uh, this gentleman here, Suji Nakamura of the Niachia Corporation, uh, made a major discovery. So basically what had happened was he worked for this company and they, um, one of the supervisors said, we want you to make a blue LED since lights work in red, green, and blue. We don't have the blue without it. We can't use it in a lot of applications. So they put him in his office and they forgot about him. And many years later, another, uh, a uh, the president or a vice president was walking through, taking a tour of the facility, and he was next to his office, and the president was like, so tell me, what project are you working on? And he said, I've just recently discovered a way to make a blue and also a white LED. And so with this, this revolutionized the way that light and lighting devices like the LEDs were around, because now we had red, green, and blue. We can now put them into displays and use them to generate pictures, whereas before we could only do red, green, and yellow. But with the blue, we now have all the colors in the light spectrum to pull them off. So with the LEDs, we created things like um, these LED arrays, which is a panel which has a few thousand little LEDs in them. And with the arrays, you can adjust, uh, you can do things like adjust the colors. So I can take this panel and show white light, or I can show red light, or blue light, or green light, or anything in between. They're going to be using a lot less information, uh, electricity. So that's going to give them the ability to lower the cost of um, operating them. But the downside is, is you're going to be paying a lot more money up front. So these panels are now starting to incorporate motherboards, electronics, things that a simple incandescent bulb didn't have. Uh, the incandescent bulb only had like two wires, positive and negative. So for a panel like this, we're now starting to move um, to about 1800 as opposed to the panels nowadays for... Um, other things like fluorescence are the incandescence, which were three to 500. So we're almost paying three times as much for the panel, but we're getting more functio functionality. We're using less electricity in the long run. So, and the LEDs are not gonna have to be replaced, whereas the incandescent light bulbs would burn out quite often. So here's an example of energy consumption for a light bulb or a series of light bulbs. So to get uh, 30,000 hours of usage, we're gonna wind up using 30 light bulbs running at 75 watts of electricity. So that's gonna run us about $300. If we want that same 30,000 hours with fluorescence, we went from 70 watt, 75 watts down to 20, so we're now using less. So now we're gonna be using about $80. Or with one LED using only 10 watts of electricity, we are now using $40. So that's going to be a savings of uh, $260 in electricity and the cost of the bulbs because this one LED can do the same thing as these four or these 30 incandescents. So that is saving money, and that is also giving us the ability to factor in a lot of that. But these things aren't always going to be as expensive as they are now. So this gentleman, Dr. Roland Hertz, or Heights, came up with a theory called Heights's Law. And basically what his theory means is, is that over time, and this could be many, many years, the cost of LEDs are going to get cheaper, but they're also going to get brighter. And he already looked at some existing trends to see from back in the 70s and the 80s and the early 90s. He could see that the um, filament output was actually going up and the cost was also getting cheaper as well. So Heitz's law is they're going to get cheaper and they're going to get brighter. And this kind of is the same for almost all electronics. The first smartphones that came out were you know, thousands of dollars. And then they've kind of come down to a, a more reasonable price. And even some of them are still staying up in the thousands of dollars. But over time, the technology gets better at making um, these new innovations. So a while back, we changed out the lighting in our studio and we replaced the lighting in our TV studio with LED panels. So we took everything out, we replaced the grid and put all that together. So how much do you think it costs our entire studio to 
uh, we left the power in place. We just took down the lights and put in new lights. Do you think it might be about 50,000, 60,000, 100,000, 500,000? I guess that would be half a million. Think it might cost us a couple million to change it? Well, the answer is $107,320 to change out the lighting in two television studios, the big one that we hold class in, and then there's a smaller studio next door that we can also uh, use for other productions. Now, once we ha once we have the ability to light something, we need to have uh, we have the ability to adapt that lighting to other uses. So through that, we have the types of different filters that we can change on the lights to adapt them. So there's filters like a color wheel or a neutral density filter. Um, this is a manual filter, kind of like a pair of sunglasses that change. Uh, we can do it electronically, and the motherboard and the sensors can change. We have the ability to do a white balance by holding up a piece of white paper and telling the camera to adjust for that. There's also things um, like especially with the white balance that you're going to have to actually change the white balance every time your light of source changes. So this isn't as much of an issue in a television studio as it is when you are going out in the field. So if you are constantly shooting something that's inside and outside, inside and outside, you're going to have to re-white balance every time you change your white balance. Um, also, if you are shooting outside on a cloudy day, not necessarily overcast, but where clouds are coming and going, keep an eye out for what's happening around with the sunlight or the clouds. So if you're under a shadow, that's going to change your lighting system. You're going to need to re-white balance. When the shadow goes away, you're going to need to come back and re-white balance. So especially with white balance, you're going to need to adjust it every time your lighting source changes. So here's an example of what White, ba white balancing uh, does. So it's basically just a white card or a white piece of paper that you just hold up in front of your camera. So with this one, this was actually shot in place. And so this guy, uh, this photographer wound up adjusting the light as he shot it each time. So then he had the light under a cloudy condition. He had it under daylight. He went underneath tungsten or incandescent light bulb. He also shot it under fluorescent and he also did a color correct shooting. And you can kind of see that the only thing he changed was the lighting. Everything else, the camera, the background, the subject, all stayed the same. So this is one of the reasons why we tell you to white balance your camera. So when you do white balance something and it looks right, nobody's really going to notice that you did it at all. But if you make a mistake with your white balance, then it's going to be something that everybody's going to notice. So in the case of these ones that are kind of orange, it was white balanced outdoors, and then they went inside to shoot... Uh, the video. Likewise, with this blue one, it was originally white balanced indoors under the 32K, and he came outside to 56K, and that's why his footage is blue. Now, you can correct it a little bit in post-production, but you're never going to get back to that original clear quality. So, in addition to white balance, one of the things I talked about was a physical filter called an ND filter or neutral density. And this is a usually a little button or dial on the camera that you would actually rotate. In the case of this camera, I've got like a little spinner. And it's attached to this dial that has different almost thicknesses of um, material that the camera can look through. So it can filter it a little bit or it can filter it a lot. But when the camera looks through that filter, it's going to make things a little bit more clear. So think about an ND filter as a pair of sunglasses. And so as you put them on, it is going to make things a little bit easier to see. Now, if you have the wrong filter on, or if you have a outdoors filter and you come inside, it's going to be even darker, and that's going to make things even harder to see through. So ND filters are a lot like sunglasses. The next type of thing I want to talk about is going to be lighting instruments. But I'm going to pick that up in the next video. So I'll see you back in just a little bit.